All right, so that we don't have any dead air, I'm going to chatter a little bit. Um, I think um, when I was asked, and I don't remember when, to participate in a panel at the Southern on dangerous disorderly damsels when talking about sex and drugs in the New South, it was like, how could I possibly say no? And it was even better when I got the, um, the pitches on each of the different talks. And since then, it's just gotten even better when I got the papers. So we are in for a treat with this panel. Um, I'm Mara Kier. I am uh, presiding, but the most important people here are the presenters and the commentators. Our first paper is going to be from Virginia Kane from the University of Alabama. She is a PhD student who is working on a dissertation called Prof Profane Dames and Estimable Madams in Birmingham and Nashville, 1870 to 1930. And her paper will be on openly and notoriously prostitution and respectability in Birmingham, Alabama, 1880 to 1920. And then we'll hear from Patricia McCourt, who is a PhD student at Mississippi State University and who is very daringly starting um, presenting a paper what she's at the early stages and still thinking about her dissertation topic. So I am very impressed by this. Um, she's going to be talking about these deleterious drugs, the gendering of addiction in the United States South and the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914. And then we will hear from Lindsay Silver, who is uh, a lecturer at Texas A&M and a PhD from Louisiana State University. Um, she is turning her dissertation into a book um, and on the life and death of Kate Townsend, gender and power in New Orleans, prostitution, um, 1858 to 1883. And she's going to be speaking on Rethinking the Scarlet Sisterhood, Mobility and Respectability in High Class Madam Networks. We're also very fortunate to have Stephanie Chalifu. Is, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, you did. Thank you, Maya. Oh, I'm so I, <laughs> um, Who is at the University of West Georgia, um, and she is works on prostitution and mobility in the 1950s South. So I think without further ado, we'll have Virginia take it away. Okay. Great. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here and deliver my paper. Beginning in 1871, newspapers across Alabama and surrounding states touted a shining new future for an industrialized South called Birmingham. But when a prostitute named Louise Wooster was lured to the quote, great and growing magic city in 1873, all she found were 20 poorly constructed houses next to a railroad crossing. Still, pinning her hopes and dreams on this town proved a good investment. By the 1880s, Wooster was a well-established and respected madam. Young Birmingham had no established infrastructure to enforce laws or propriety, and in the chaos, prostitutes, madams, and others' reactions to them shaped early urban organization. The city's cleanup 40 years later corresponds with historical narratives of the New South's top-down reform process, designed to modernize and make palatable the South to Northern investors. But what happened in Birmingham was different, Although prostitution had never been legal, the city's leaders promoted it. Even when public sentiment turned against prostitution, rather than enforce extant laws, politicians in concert with police established a vice district to regulate it. The only successful anti-prostitution campaign came from an Italian immigrant named Felicia Tedeschi, who lived in the red light district. In Birmingham, reform was a bottom up process against the wishes of city leaders. From conception, Birmingham and prostitution were intimately connected. In the 1870s, I'm sorry, future mayor Colonel James R. Powell advertised the city as an entertainment mecca. He promoted Birmingham as, quote, a perfect Muhammad's paradise of lovely women, 
which, quote, brought more farmers to town than you could count. According to Powell's associates, while the farmers, quote, were looking all over the Red Mountain for the ladies, why, the colonel sold them lots. As a mining and heavy industry district lacking law enforcement and flush with young men in cash, Birmingham was fertile ground for madams and prostitutes. In a memoir written near the end of her life, Wooster explained that, quote, I have never regretted coming, for here I have found some of the best and dearest of friends, and here some of the brightest days of my shadowed life have been passed. The immense misfortunes of the Panic of 1873 paired with a deadly cholera outbreak, nearly killed the infant city. Most residents abandoned Birmingham, leaving behind those too poor to leave, with only a few to care for them. Though possessing the means to evacuate, Wooster explained how she and other prostitutes remained to, quote, nurse the sick and prepare the dead for burial. Despite their best efforts, by the end of the year, the, quote, city was dead, but not Wooster's infatuation with it. Although forced to leave for lack of a customer base, she was determined to return. In 1881, she stepped foot into a booming Birmingham, refreshed with access to material comforts, from sidewalks and street lamps to grocery stores and restaurants, a far cry from the graveyard she had left. Birmingham's explosive growth in the 1880s far outpaced the ability of its leaders to regulate it. Such rapid expansion combined economic, cultural, and political instability to create an atmosphere more akin to the Western frontier than established cities elsewhere in the nation. The city of 25,000 only counted 23 policemen under one captain and one chief. Furthermore, court cases were heard not by a legally educated judge in a courtroom, but by the sitting mayor in his office. The legal system was both impoverished and corrupt. Poorly paid officers earned extra money for each arrest and fines funded the government while convict labor decreased costs of public works and mines. The city benefited more from fining than jailing female criminals. As a result, crime, especially prostitution, was allowed to flourish. In 1884, after just three years in Birmingham, Wooster had saved enough money to buy her first bordello, a two-story building on 4th Avenue North at the city's heart. The $2,900 purchase proved her success first as a prostitute and now a madam. Within two years, Wooster had grown her business to five white prostitutes and four black servants with a property valuation of $4,000. Her bagnio was across the street from City Hall where hotels, restaurants, saloons, and the county courthouse were in easy walking distance. A nearby police station ensured help would be quick to arrive in times of trouble. Customers of the best sorts could easily find their way to her establishment, and she capitalized on these relationships. For example, Wooster bought the building next door from John Snow, a, quote, self-made and independent man, for $12,000 that allowed her to separate her living and working space. By any metric, Wooster was a brilliant businesswoman. Between 1880 and 1889, she was far from Birmingham's only successful madam yet newspapers only reported seven prostitution-related arrests. None of the alleged offenders were charged with prostitution alone. Instead, these men and women were arrested for additional crimes, including adultery, disorderly conduct, assault and battery, and assault with a deadly weapon. In other words, only being a prostitute or a customer was not enough for an arrest. Across the decade, 37 separate women, including Wooster and her sister Maggie Bracken, listed their occupations as madams in the city directory. This record is far from exhaustive and only included white madams. By all accounts, prostitution was not only an accepted, but also a promoted part of urban life in Birmingham through the 1880s. By 1890, the exponential growth of the 1880s slowed to a steadier and more sustainable rate, allowing infrastructure and institutions to catch up. Alabama's state legislature created an independent police commission in Birmingham to address increasingly overt collusion between politicians and law enforcement and the corruption of police officers. Additionally, Jefferson County Criminal Court and the Inferior Criminal Court of Birmingham took the overwhelming burden of cases off the mayor. Still, city funds for public works and administration primarily originated in licensing. Given that the most expensive licenses were for liquor, Birmingham remained indebted to a criminal, or at the very least a vice, element. 
Many of Birmingham's leaders also maintain ties to crime on an individual basis. For example, while running for probate judge, former Mayor A.O. Lane laid bare the involvement of other candidates, including one who, quote, was kicked out of a Negro body house by the notorious speckled queen. Through the decade, more attention was given to crime, but primarily as a breach of propriety rather than a moral crusade. Of 68 prostitution-adjacent arrests reported on in the 1890s, only three were madams charged with some variation of keeping a disorderly house. Five women were arrested for prostitution, three specifically for streetwalking, and only five men were arrested for visiting brothels, two of whom were arrested merely for being minors. The most common charge, disorderly conduct, was associated with violence that required police intervention, drunkenness in the streets, or both. In contrast, madams like Wooster and Bracken continued openly and notoriously operating bordellos at the city center by catering to a higher class clientele with women and men who kept vice indoors and respectable veneers in the streets. The inference is clear. Buying and selling sex in and of itself was not a problem. It only became a problem once other lines of propriety were crossed. Examining punishments reveals why. With few exceptions, fines rather than jail time were imposed. Sending prostitutes to jail cost Birmingham money, but fines continue to support urban development and pay law enforcement salaries. The fiscal benefit to the city's leaders far outweighed the cost in terms of public discomfort, at least until the turn of the century. A related concern for the reform-minded was the proliferation of vice through the city, but this too was more an issue of propriety than a fervent anti-prostitution campaign. Because Wooster and the city's other wealthy madams behaved like successful businesswomen and philanthropists rather than violent or predatory criminals, they operated unmolested by the law. Through the 1890s, Wooster used the money she earned through prostitution for philanthropic causes. Glossing over the rough reality of sex work, Wooster explained how she and other madams offered care and support to desperate girls and destitute women. In contrast, Christian organizations offered only judgment. White Christian women would not acknowledge Wooster in the street, but they did privately visit her house to ask for donations. Not only the city, its politicians, and its police profited from prostitution, its reformers also benefited from allowing madams to accrue wealth for contributions. Wooster's retirement in 1901 coincided with a critical shift in views on prostitution. Although a minority called for complete eradication, the city leaders proposed a districting system. This would allow Birmingham to continue profiting from vice while putting it out of sight and hopefully out of mind for polite white society. Mayor Ward, the police commission, and police chief Weir greenlit the red light district in October of 1905. The dirty and undesirable 7th Ward neighborhood around avenues A and B between 21st and 24th streets abutting the railroad, already home to the city's black and immigrant populations, would now be a safe place for extra-legal prostitution. Before this decision was finalized, self-segregation of white vice had already begun. Between Wooster's retirement and Bracken's death in 1905, even high-class madams and prostitutes largely vacated the city center. Wooster eventually moved to the south side, but she retained ownership of the two buildings on 4th Avenue North for rental income from legal businesses. Other prostitutes also read the newspapers or otherwise heard about the proposed vice district, and those whispers were confirmed when police served notices to vacate to known brothels. By mid-September of 1905, several madams had already purchased property and were building bordellos in the proposed red light district. This foresight saved many women's livelihoods by avoiding the sweeping raids outside the new vice district. By 1910, despite significant infrastructure advancements, Birmingham's law enforcement only numbered 154 officers. This was hardly enough to effectively police vice spread across a city of 33,415. Given the interconnectedness of drinking, drinking, gambling, and prostitution, concentrating bagnios in a specific district effectively concentrated other types of crime in an area small enough to be patrolled. Not having to police body houses freed officers to address other types of crime. Between 1900 and 1910, Birmingham's newspapers only reported 13 instances of prostitution-related arrests. As with the previous decades, 12 of the 13 involved additional crimes, including murder, attempted murder, and robbery. The only exception was an intentional raid of the red light district that resulted in the arrests of 54 male customers. 
With a $5 fine each, this netted the city a tidy $250 for a single night's work. Reflecting on the policy in 1909, Ward bragged that segregation of vice, quote, has made it possible for women and children to go and be seen in every other part of the city at all times without fear of being misunderstood or embarrassed. It has done more to prevent debauchery and murder, more to reduce licentiousness than any other measures. Yet Ward was careful not to advocate for the abolition of prostitution entirely. Considering that Birmingham still benefited from vice, it was in no one's best interest to eradicate the city's less savory characters altogether. Furthermore, the vice district concentrated not only undesirable activities, but also undesirable people, including immigrants, African Americans, prostitutes, bookmakers, drunkards, the abject poor and homeless, in one area of the urban space. The rest of the city was free to polish a shiny image of white middle-class civility. None of this, of course, provided comfort for the non-criminal residents of these wards. As early as January 1906, public protests appeared, alleging collusion between Mayor Ward, Police Chief Weir, and the court system. A committee of frustrated 7th Ward residents sought to expose corruption and beg for help Quote, in our effort to crush this infamous and outrageous effort to locate these dens of vice and corruption within the limits of our ward. More Seventh Ward residents complained that they, quote, were compelled to walk several blocks out of the way to avoid the disgraceful crowds that thronged the streets just to get downtown. But protests from professional men remained unheard until Felicia Tedeschi, a female Italian immigrant, took legal action. Tedeschi and her family lived above the grocery store they owned at 2202 Avenue B, right in the middle of the red light district. After 1905, at least six brothels operated in a one block radius around their building. And as Ward himself had claimed, having prostitutes, drunks, and gamblers as neighbors was not safe for good mothers and children especially when the Tedeschis had the opportunity for economic advancement and acceptance into white middle-class society, they could not afford to be associated with vice. Over several years, beginning in late 1906, Tedeschi brought at least six chancery court cases, alleging damages done by nearby bad news. For example, in a complaint against Lottie Hill and Z.T. Mosley, Tedeschi claimed that many lewd and dissolute women congregate in and occupy their house, and these women draw around them many drunk, profane, and dissolute men who engage with them in drunken orgies and in loud and indecent talk and noisy and boisterous conduct, and said dissolute women who occupy said premises are continually disporting and exhibiting themselves on the porches of said house, dressed in an indecent and immodest manner, and soliciting men passing along. Tedeschi continued, quote, such conduct, as aforesaid, has rendered the entire district indecent and unsuited for habitation by decent and moral people. She claimed to be unable to enjoy her home or receive social, social visits from friends. With the value of her family's home and husband's business, the health and well-being of her family, and even her friendships at stake, Tedeschi was determined to rid the neighborhood of the blight of prostitution. One witness's testimony offered insight into the evolving morality of Birmingham citizens. A.J. Tompert, an engineer living in the Tedeschi's neighborhood, explained how the, quote, white whorehouses established there have been more detrimental to the Tedeschi property than the Negro dives that have been there heretofore. Gambling houses, bars, and even black run body houses were expected parts of life in Birmingham's least desirable neighborhoods. It was widely accepted that the city's poorest and non-white residents would partake in such vice. For white women to do the same, however, was now neither expected nor accepted, even in the poorest parts of the city. Tedeschi's efforts inspired a tidal wave of change that flushed prostitutes out of the city. Police Chief Weir's replacement, George H. Bodecker, ordered all disorderly houses closed in December of 1911. Bodecker explained that, quote, while he may not be able to clap the lid on vice, rivet it down, and seal it hermetically, he will insist that there shall be shown some regard 
for the laws written in the city code. In the city's most widely distributed paper, reformer William M. McGrath lambasted Birmingham's leaders for getting rich off vice. He claimed red light districts only, quote, created a municipally owned and conducted business of prostitution and put in the city treasury a goodly percentage of the profits of the sale of women's bodies. The cumulative efforts of Tedeschi's suits and responses ultimately resulted in the closure of the red light district. The year 1913 marked the end of an era in Birmingham. On May 16th, a 71-year-old Wooster died in her home. A significant portion of her large estate, worth $75,000, roughly $2 million in 2021, was left to support her living sisters and their children for the rest of their lives. Wooster was buried in the first property she bought in Birmingham, a plot in Oak Hill Cemetery. Louise was laid to rest next to her sister by blood Maggie and several other sisters by trade for whom she cared in life and buried at her expense on her plot in death. Then on October 1st, 1913, the city commission officially declared an end to the red light district. Reported arrests after this point reveal an increase in policing against prostitution, not just related crimes. Over the next 10 years, both men and women were arrested for running and visiting body houses with no other charges. Fines also increased from $5 to upwards of $25 for prostitutes and customers. The cleanup involved more than just evicting prostitutes, a task largely complete by 1920. Residents tried to erase every vestige of accepted prostitution from the city by raising most of the bordellos by 1930. The early history of Birmingham is inextricable from prostitution. Rather than being an undesirable corrupting influence on urban space, prostitutes were foundational to Birmingham's survival and prosperity. Despite its illegality, the city's founders, politicians, police, and even the public benefited from allowing prostitution to grow because fines and fees brought money and sex for sale brought men. Men in turn invested their own bodies and funds into growing Birmingham from a railroad crossing into a booming industrial urban area. As the city grew, creating a red light district gave Birmingham the best of all worlds, continued profits from vice for public works and insulation from salacious behavior for its law-abiding citizens. Unlike common portrayals of the New South, Birmingham's leaders did not drive reform. Instead, Birmingham's poor and immigrant population drove anti-vice campaigns in a bid to increase their own socioeconomic station commensurate with the rest of the city. As Daphne Swain persuasively argued about Northern and Midwestern urban spaces in this period, quote, women saved the city. My work on Birmingham nuances this argument by revealing how poor, disenfranchised, and immigrant women, not middle-class reformers, part of national organizations, saved Southern urban spaces. For 40 years, Birmingham had been nurtured at the bosoms of prostitutes. When the city was sick, prostitutes nursed it back to health. When it was broke, madams provided welfare by employing the downtrodden, paying taxes, purchasing licenses, settling fines, and even privately contributing to Christian-run charities. But at 40 years old, Birmingham had developed recognizable New South ideologies, institutions, and moral codes to regulate urban space and urban people. This ultimately meant that prostitutes, the mothers and caregivers of the infant city, were disowned, disavowed, and thrown out like so much trash. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. That was wonderful. Now we're gonna hear from Patricia McCork on these deleterious drugs. Okay, everyone, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. In her 1901 autobiography, Old Times in Dixieland, A Southern Matron's Memories, Louisiana temperance reformer Caroline E. Merrick recounted an alarming exchange with her physician. After telling him she had been feeling unusually anxious, he offered to prescribe any medicine from a long list he recited, among which were opium, Indian hemp, and arsenic. 
Good gracious, she replied, am I to swallow all these poisonous things? The doctor then tried to convince Merrick of the curative powers of rest, even telling her she not, need not worry if she was too intoxicated to attend to her infant daughter. Outraged, Merrick continued to protest, but the man quickly interrupted her, warning, Now is the time to stop, lest you come to the door of an insane asylum. While Merrick may have embellished this tale for dramatic effect, it reveals the vested interest Southern women had in pushing for tighter control of narcotics like opium and cocaine. Temperance literature such as this helped shed light on the growing rates of opiate use among well-off white Southern women in the latter half of the 19th century. Though several scholars have recognized the decisive role Southern states played in the push for federal drug control at the turn of the 20th century, their analysis has remained largely confined to the category of race. The appeals that commanded historians' attention are those which demonized African Americans and their use of cocaine, often accompanied by allegations of rape and demands that white women's virtue be fiercely protected. While these calls to action deserve historians' careful scrutiny, as they demonstrate the role racial anxieties played in shaping federal drug policy, a much wider variety of forces contributed to the public outcry for drug reform in the South. Alongside white Southerners' purported horror at African-American cocaine usage, a broader cultural shift regarding respectable drug use was occurring. Although Southerners more or less tolerated opiate use among white women in the mid-1800s, these attitudes were not static. By the close of the 19th century, female opiate habitués garnered substantial attention, and Southerners began to craft a discourse surrounding addiction that relied not just on notions of racial difference, but of gender. Female addicts increasingly took on the image in both popular culture and medical literature as the victims of careless physicians or as mentally unstable, morally degenerate, unfit mothers, and unhappy wives. Additionally, all negative portrayals of drug use, whether or not they targeted women, helped inspire activism and change the behavior of both physicians and lay people. By analyzing the stigmatization of vice through the lens of gender, I will demonstrate that widely held assumptions about health and respectability were just as crucial in diminishing the female addict population as they were in creating it. This shift in discourse was but one major factor that resulted in the passage of the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914. In his illuminating 1983 article, The Hidden Epidemic, Opiate, Opiate Addiction and Cocaine Use in the South, 1860 to 1920, David Courtright illustrated the average opiate addict by referencing the grouchy Mrs. DuBose character from Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. This fictitious Alabama widow maintained her morphine habits, habit for decades, inspiring pity among her neighbors, but no one felt it was their place to address what was obviously an open secret. Indeed, Southern communities did not portray female medical addicts as menaces to society like it did working class, non-white, and immigrant drug users. Nor did authorities want to put sick old women in jail, but their swelling numbers among the ranks of habitual drug users did not go unnoticed or unaddressed. By the time of the passage of the Harrison Narcotic Act, a federal ban on the sale of opium and cocaine without a prescription, and a subsequent anti-maintenance 1919 Supreme Court decision, the white middle class female portion of the addict population had already decreased significantly. Indeed, the punitive measures ushered in during the early 20th century did not target respectable drug users because their numbers had already diminished. What then accounted for this shift? First and foremost, doctors across the country quickly realized that their liberal prescription of powerful analgesics and stimulants did not come without consequences. A flurry of publications on the opium habit emerged alongside discussions of alcoholism, abuse of chloral hydrate, and later cocaine and hashish. Opium had lost its privileged status that Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. bestowed when he dubbed it the medicine which the creator himself seems to prescribe in 1860. Southern medical journals from the period reveal a heightened sense of awareness of the problem. As one Louisville-based doctor cautioned in 1889, opium should be firmly and persistently avoided. The patient is much better without it. Here in the South, this lesson needs to be impressed firmly upon the minds of the profession. In the closing decades of the 19th century, physicians came under increased scrutiny for employing opium as a cure-all, especially for female diseases, 
a blanket term for gynecological conditions, and neurasthenia, a psychological diagnosis common among middle and upper class white women. Of great concern also to physicians in the late 19th century were patent medicines, or non-prescription products which promised to cure virtually any ailment, often containing undisclosed amounts of narcotics and alcohol before the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act. Most notorious among these was Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup, known to contain opium and marketed for use on fussy, teething babies. In an article reprinted in the Carolina Medical Journal, one doctor expressed his frustration with women who endangered their infants in hopes of set settling them down. When a child is cross and irritable, he explained, the temptation to the mother to repeat an opiate is very great and should be guarded against as far as possible. The number of babies who have been forced into the opium habit is appallingly large. Although patent medicines such as these were legal and widely advertised, this doctor's 1895 testimony, Opium in the Diseases of Children, makes it clear that pejorative associations between women and drugs were well underway. One Alabama doctor noted in 1885 that opium use was common in women of idleness and prostitution, thereby complicating the respectable stereotype. It is doubtful, however, David Courtright argued, that medical treatises drastically changed the attitudes of most ordinary men and women whose understandings of such matters were shaped less by specialized journals uh, than by gossip, stereotypes, and strictures of evangelical Protestantism. Accordingly, we turn from drug use in the medical context to its shifting position in 19th century Southern culture. A misconception that accompanies the Mrs. DuBose character is that women's drug use was perfectly acceptable so long as it was kept private. While shooting morphine behind closed doors was indeed preferable to traveling to a saloon in New Orleans' Storyville district, the American public's increased awareness of its drug problem made women and addiction the topic of many a salacious expose. For example, a South Carolina reporter labeled addicts slaves of a degrading and brutalizing habit and did not shy away from acknowledging the prevalence of opiate use among women, reasoning, it is more convenient than liquor and less liable to be detected. Though these women often inspired pity for their careless physicians never should have prescribed so much in the first place, public acknowledgement of women's attempts to hide their drug use signaled that it was a habit of which they ought to be ashamed. Indeed, publications with female target audiences warned women to avoid such narcotics. As early as 1876, an article in Frank Leslie's Ladies Magazine advised against using patent medicines to calm their nerves and get a good night's rest as advertised. There is grave reason to fear the real nature of the operation by which these deleterious drugs, one and all, bring about the unconsciousness that burlesques natural sleep. Connections between gender and addiction went beyond print media. While doctors might have answered their every complaint by writing a prescription, and an unregulated pharmaceutical market kept them well supplied, women actually became some of the most vocal advocates for drug reform. Contemporary understandings of drug use cannot be divorced from the broader political discourse of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, particularly the temperance movement. The partition between and vastly different treatment of alcohol and drugs in American society today has caused a great many researchers to distance the two categories in an era where the boundaries, especially to reformers and medical professionals, were much less distinct. Tellingly, when Frances Willard visited Atlanta in 1890 to deliver her annual address to the WCTU, she made sure to attack a problem her audience was coming to know quite well. The opium habit is dangerously prevalent, she declared. Women are using a small lozenge of opium carried in bonbon boxes and taken when one is tired or depressed. We must try to reach these deluded women by press and pulpit, persuasion and prayer. Opium belonged just as much to the category of vice as it did to medicine, and reform-minded women intended to prevent its corrupting influence, much like liquor, gambling, and prostitution. It, as progressive women exploited society's understanding of them as the more virtuous moral sex to obtain political clout, their vice crusades made female addicts sound like a contradiction in terms. 
Anna Julia Cooper painted a most miserable picture of drug use in her 1892 book, A Voice from the South. Dedicated to the progress of the race, determined to combat any and every vice or negative influence, Cooper railed against intoxicants and in the environment in which people use them. Men and women herded together like cattle, breathing in malaria and typhus from an atmosphere seething with moral as well as physical impurity, she despaired, reveling in vice as their native habitat, and then to drown the whisperings of their highest, higher consciousness, flying to narcotics and opiates, till the proper image of God is transformed into a fit associate for demons, a besotted, enervated, idiotic wreck, or else a monster of wickedness, terrible and destructive. To Cooper, drugs conjured images of sin, psychological degeneracy, and filth. A far cry from the enduring stereotype of ladies sipping laudanum in the comfort and safety of their own parlors. As aforementioned, cocaine alarmed just as many Southerners as opiates, albeit, if albeit for uh, different reasons. Incendiary articles that played on the fears of the Negro cocaine fiend appeared in newspapers across the South, accompanied by demands for prohibition of all narcotics. A letter to the editor in the popular Jackson, Mississippi magazine, Vardaman's Weekly, uh, even blamed black pharmacists for fueling a drug crisis. The irate reader complained, Mr. Editor, no Negro living has the morality that a physician should have, yet we license them every year upon supposed satisfactory evidence of moral character, and we can't revoke their license, though they dispense cocaine broadcast to the race encouraging the rape of white women and murder of white men. Michael M. Cohen highlighted the racist motivations behind drug regulation in his 2006 Southern Cultures essay, Jim Crow's Drug War. The South was quite precocious in its zeal for drug regulation, Cohen argued, referencing total bans on cocaine in Georgia, Florida, and Tennessee all before 1903. Southern leg legislatures also led the charge in Congress for the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Harrison Narcotic Act. When it came time for the United States to declare its first war on drugs during the Progressive Era, he concluded, the South's racial politics fused with broad national anxieties about race and immigration to shape dramatically not only U.S. public policy, but also the nation's moral judgments about drugs as well. Cohen's narrative, though, did not account for the role that Southern women, black and white, played in pushing for narcotic regulation. Raising awareness about the cocaine problem, too, were reform-minded African-American women like Anna M. Tate. Writing in the black newspaper, the Savannah Tribune, on her agenda for community uplift, Tate stated, cocaine is another fiend more dangerous, though not as quick as it takes several years for its victims to overtake death. One authority says, this new vice has proved to be a creator of criminal and unusual forms of violence, yet neither our national nor state government restricts the importation of this soul-destroying drug. More telling evidence that women's drug use was not simply swept under the rug are the myriad sanitariums offering addiction treatment that popped up in southern, southern cities toward the end of the 19th century. Savvy entrepreneurs also began to realize that addictive patent medicines had acquired a bad reputation. Thus, they produced equally dubious nostrums that promised a cure for the opium habit, the whiskey habit, and more. The traditional patent medicines ads that covered newspapers gave way to these liquid cures and other elixirs that promised to contain no harmful drugs. Leslie Keeley, an Illinois physician, even opened a chain of treatment facilities uh, paired with a secret recipe that consumers could either purchase by mail or get the full experience by obeying a regimen in-house. Uh, following the Keeley model, Atlanta physician Basil M. Woolley patented his own treatment and it advertised testimonies in newspapers across the South. Woolley worked with the Atlanta Constitution to publish a promotional pamphlet, and it proves a remarkable source for scholars inquisitive about gendered portrayals of addiction. In his 1879 tract, The Opiate Habit, Opium Habit and Its Cure, uh, Woolley included melodramatic short stories about his patients who had successfully beat their addiction. One such uh, tale, titled The Mystery of Helen Byrne, is incredibly rich. In an undisclosed southern hamlet, the narrator describes a young socialite who had become a recluse of sorts. 
After catching a glimpse of the woman on a stroll one evening, he was captivated by her beauty. The next day, he asked a lady acquaintance to tell him about the young woman, Helen Byrne. The acquaintance told him he would want nothing to do with that girl. Why, he implored. Oh, because she's so strange. She does such queer things, the acquaintance warned. She is up all night and walks about the grounds like a ghost. She takes long rides on horseback alone or worse with a miserable little hunchback, a kind of servant about the place, the son of her father's housekeeper. She secluded herself and was seen only on rare occasions when she came in unexpectedly, sometimes over gay and at others bitter and scathing. This lady acquaintance was painting the picture of a woman suffering from a tragic pathology that produced roller coaster mood swings and antisocial behaviors, a disease none other than the opium habit. Adding another layer to this gendered portrayal of drug use, the narrator began to take great pity on Helen Byrne, empathizing with the poor woman because his own mother had suffered from the same condition. He described his distant father who struggled to keep the family together. The world pitied him as an agreeable man bound, unfortunately, to a sickly, queer and dull wife. It was the opium curse that helped work division and woe in our home. It engendered suspicion and jealousy, and these provoked accusations, complaints, tears, and morbid gloom that alienated the husband. In 1879, this author described the fictional mother as a burden, her drug dependency, a strain on her relationship, and a young son left feeling abandoned by both parents. The story takes a dramatic final turn. The narrator, having fallen in love with Helen Byrne, perhaps reminded of his dear ailing mother, decides to save the young woman from herself. He sends her to Dr. Wooley to be cured of her habit. The narrator then paints an idyllic picture of middle-class domesticity as they are happily ever after. Two years have passed. We are seated in our cheery home. A glowing hickory fire throws its ruddy reflection over the fair face of my wife holding our baby boy and watching him as he gravely examines the contents of a rosewood box. Not that, you will break it. Mama keeps it as a souvenir of what she owes to God and two good men. I catch the whisper, and looking up from my book, see in her hand a vial labeled, Wooly's Opium Cure. Victorian melodrama aside, this anecdote presents drug use as antithetical to contemporary standards of femininity, bound up in morality, motherhood, and marriage. Crucial to understanding the impetus for and the effects that the Harrison Narcotic Act had on the drug using population is the rapidly shifting demography of that population just before the law's passage. Much has been written on the transformation of the opiate addict, uh, going from predominantly white, middle class, and female to a mostly male criminal class of addicts. Uh, so the historiography goes, punitive measures created the American junkie. While federal control certainly created criminals out of addicts, we must grapple with the fact that this transformation was already underway. We cannot know if social stigma motivated women to put the needle down, so to speak, but we do know that by the first decades of the 20th century, both the medical community and the general public were well aware of the dangers associated with narcotics. Not only did Americans know that opiates and cocaine were highly addictive, but they had attached a host of other negative connotations with drugs, all in conflict with what was supposed to represent feminine, middle-class respectability. Respectable drug use was almost always a myth. The best a woman could do to save face was hide her habit. It is telling that Mrs. DuBose evoked pity, even if she did not face hostility. This aging widow, though, was more a relic of a past era than she was representative. When we consider the gender dynamics of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era in tandem with the stigma surrounding drug use, it becomes clear why there was never a second generation of Mrs. DuBose's. Thank you all so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Patricia. Now it is Lindsay's turn with Rethinking the Scarlet Sisterhood. I don't think we can, can everybody hear Lindsay? No, no sound, no sound for Lindsay. You can, okay. Try again. Okay. Okay. 
think I can hear something now. Try again. Speak. No. Um. Lindsay, may I suggest that you, if you can hear me, may I suggest that you exit and rejoin? Mara, do we have a tech person in our? Um, so, oh wait, wait. Uh, do we have a tech person in our? Uh, uh, so Maggie Riley is. Let me. I'm gonna send Maggie a a note. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Lindsay, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but we are reaching out to our tech person. Um, okay. Okay. Well, I'm not sure. Stephanie, what do your comments look like? Are they, um, do you deal with each paper in turn? Could we hear some of your comments and while we wait for a tech person to um, deal with Lindsay's vocal issues or what would you suggest that we do? Mara, I'm happy to deliver comments, but they will, of course, be completely um, out of context. Yeah. Um, okay. However, uh, uh, have we, Mara, have you heard before I began to um, do anything with Lindsay's paper? Um, do, have you, uh, I'm looking in the chat, do you, um, uh, do you know if there's anyone who is working on this issue before I began? Um, no, nobody is responding. I mean, I think there, someone did suggest that the moderator might read Lindsay's paper. Um, I do have a copy of Lindsay's paper. Um, what, what do we think about that as a potential solution? So Mara, might I suggest that you begin to read okay. Lindsay's paper since I'm going to be delivering comments and okay. I'm going to reach out to, um, uh, okay, Lindsay. Yeah, absolutely. We'll try to mute everybody first. Okay. Um, and um, so let's, if everybody on the um, page could please mute for say 10 seconds and let's see if this gives Lindsay a moment. Okay, Lindsay, um, I'm sorry. And these are, you know, this is just, um, uh, I'm sure Mara would agree. These are just the things that are going to happen. So Mara, might I suggest, um, since I'm commenting, um, would you mind starting, uh, what do you think? Uh, do, would you like to start reading Lindsay's paper and I will reach out, I'll start doing an email reach out to comment or to um, um, our tech folks. Um, Lindsay, I'm so sorry. It, this is just, and we just, we, by the way, folks who are listening, we all logged in earlier and we checked all of this, like we did our due diligence, but, um, 
sometimes weird tech things happen. So Mara, um, would yep. you feel comfortable starting Lindsay's paper? And I will um, uh, see if I can reach out to folks. Okay. Okay. Um, I will start reading the paper and um, Lindsay, I hope I do it justice. So Lindsay's paper is retitled Rethinking the Scarlet Sisterhood, Mobility and Respectability in High Class Madam Networks. Kate Townsend was one of the wealthiest and well-known madams in post-bellum New Orleans. The economic power Townsend amassed was in part a direct result of her recruitment of native-born women to work as prostitutes at her high-class brothel at 40 Basin Street. At least once a year, Townsend traveled to major cities, mostly Chicago, but a few times New York City, for this purpose. In order to find women willing to work for her in New Orleans, Townsend established connections that were much more cooperative than competitive in nature with other metropolitan high-class madams. In making these recruiting trips, Townsend participated in a loosely organized, unofficial network of madams that had actually existed for at least a few decades. However, despite the importance of these madam networks to high-class prostitution, they have rarely remained largely undetected by scholars. And this paper is part of a chapter of my book manuscript that looks at a variety of modes of mobility for high class madams and prostitutes that were connected to their relationship with other women engaged in prostitution. In an attempt to assess the long standing feminist debate over whether a sisterhood existed among these women, it is much more fruitful to examine Townsend's relationships with other madams and prostitutes in terms of how mobility influenced and shaped these relationships. Overall, mobility served as a means for these women to access power at a time when most women were virtually powerless. These madam networks were one of the most crucial aspects of that power, as they not only provided a considerable degree of independence and freedom to prostitutes, but they also were a key component of a madam's financial success. Kate Townsend's experiences of recruiting prostitutes demonstrate the influence of respectability upon these trips, from Townsend pretending to be an upper-class married woman in New York to attending elaborate banquet receptions thrown in her honor in Chicago. Through the process of participating in these networks, high-class madams like Townsend displayed an incredible amount of sophistication as businesswomen who used their acumen to amass wealth and power. The existence of these high-class madam networks across the country facilitated the mobility of prostitutes beyond a single city. Although no formal network existed, informal arrangements between madams in various cities ensured a continuous flow of women working in high-class brothels across the country. These networks were not unique to the postbellum era, as evidence demonstrates they were also utilized by high-class madams before the Civil War. In antebellum New Orleans, for example, high-class madams such as Clara Fisher, Nellie Otis, Bianca Robbins, and Floral Burdell all participated in these networks and preferred recruiting prostitutes in New York City. Unfortunately for Robbins and Burdell, they lost their lives in October 1866 when the Evening Star sank on the return voyage from New York. On that particular trip, Robbins and Burdell, along with four other New Orleans madams, went to New York City about a month earlier to recruit prostitutes for the winter season from the fashionable metropolitan houses in the city. All six madams died at sea, as well as the reported 97, most likely an exaggerated number, of prostitutes traveling back with them. Although it is unknown which New York madams the New Orleans madams had connections with, it is clear that by mid-century, the links between these two major cities kept women on the move and high-class brothels fully staffed with new recruits. Although Kate Townsend made three recruiting trips to New York City during the 17 years she was a high-class madam, she preferred Chicago and made the trip annually. During her time in Chicago, Townsend successfully established working relationships with several high-class madams. These madams included Jenny Williams and Emma Ritchie, or French Emma, both women who ran luxurious establishments on 4th Avenue, as well as Carrie Watson, located at 441 South Clark Street. 
Both Townsend, how Townsend establish these connections with other madams in distant cities remains unknown. It is also unclear whether any of these madams came to New Orleans to recruit women to work for themselves. Scattered evidence exists that suggests they possibly did, as well as evidence of madams from elsewhere visiting New Orleans potentially to recruit prostitutes. For example, in 1881, the New Orleans Daily Picayune reprinted an article from a St. Louis paper that detailed the escapades of New Orleans firefighters while visiting Chicago and briefly mentioned a trip Carrie Watson made to New Orleans two years prior. According to that article, while in New Orleans, Watson was feasted and feted and not allowed, as she says, to put up a scent. In fact, so charmed was she with New Orleans hospitality that she resolved on the visit of the firemen to return the compliments paid to her. And to that end, she determined to give the boys a grand banquet at her mansion on South Clark Street. This type of treatment shown to Watson was similar to Townsend's reception by Emma Ritchie in Chicago, as described by a former prostitute employed by Ritchie. Even though the article does not mention Townsend or the reason why Watson was in New Orleans, it certainly suggests the possibility that Watson was on a recruiting trip that was facilitated by Townsend. In addition, Clara Granger, a madam from Memphis, Memphis was a guest of Molly Johnson's at 40 Basin Street in January 1887. The Daily Picayune reported that Granger was in New Orleans visiting for the holidays. However, it is entirely possible she was in the city to recruit women for her own brothel. Not much evidence exists on how these madam networks fun functioned. However, testimony from Townsend's succession provides limited insight as to how Townsend recruited women in New York and Chicago. The most telling of all the Townsend succession testimony came from Troy Troyville Sykes, who was Townsend's lover of 25 years. According to Sykes, who often joined Townsend on such trips, and upon arrival, they would go around to the various high-class establishments and drink wine in the parlor in the company with the madam, prostitutes, and esteemed clients. During the three visits Townsend and Sykes made to New York City, they stayed at some of the city's finest hotels on Broadway, including the Gilsey House and Grand Central Hotel. Townsend's celebrity status did not in apply in New York, and in order to avoid any negative attention at such respectable establishments, the couple registered as husband and wife. Sykes also rented additional rooms at a different hotel to serve as a place for women interested in coming to New Orleans to call on Townsend to discuss the arrangements. According to Sykes, on one of these trips, Townsend brought back as many as a dozen women from Amelia Graham's brothel located on West 16th Street. When Townsend and Sykes made their near annual trip to Chicago, circumstances changed lightly. Most likely because Townsend went to Chicago numerous times, she built more substantial working relationships with madams that possibly turned into friendships. Townsend did not typically stay in hotels in Chicago. Instead, she was a guest at Jenny Williams or Carrie Watson's brothels. According to Sykes, the only exception was Emma Ritchie's, where Townsend never slept. It also appears that Townsend was more familiar and comfortable in Chicago, as she got herself situated to remain in either Williams or Watson's brothel for a week or two, while Sykes either boarded at a local hotel or went on to New York alone. Mara, I think I the ability think of Townsend can, to visit these brothels as an honored guest and recruit women directly from them suggests a certain amount of cooperation rather than outright competition among high class madams. Mara, test, yep. May I interrupt you, Lindsay? Sorry, do you I, I have audio now? Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mara, do you mind if I suggest that Lindsay picks up where you left off? I think she should. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, tech no, difficulties you. are going to occur. Thank you so much, Mara. And thank you, Lindsay. No, thank you. I'm just going to start at the beginning of that paragraph. Um, the ability of Townsend to visit these brothels as an honored guest and recruit women directly from them 
suggests a certain amount of cooperation rather than outright competition among high-class madams. The testimony of a woman who Townsend attempted to recruit demonstrates how Townsend engaged in the process of recruitment as well as the extent of Townsend's celebrity in Chicago. Jeanette Harleth, later known as Mrs. Robert McCandish Foster and initially known as Lizzie Marie Lowe, met Townsend in Chicago at Emma Ritchie's in October, 1882. According to Harleth, quote, everyone knew her there, the principal people such as the pugilist Patty Ryan and several aldermen of the city, the city clerk and several others. On the night Townsend arrived in the city, an extravagant banquet that included a printed menu was thrown in her honor at Ritchie's brothel. While Townsend's attempt to recruit Harleth was unsuccessful, she was clearly reaping the benefits of her connections with other madams in Chicago. These annual trips typically resulted in Townsend successfully recruiting women from these high-class brothels to work for her in New Orleans, and she paid for their train fare to make the trip south. In addition, once agreeable working relationships were established, um, Townsend and the prostitutes who worked for, I'm sorry, were established, I'm sorry, once they were established between Townsend and prostitutes who worked for her, some women chose to return year after year to work the winter season in New Orleans, as was the case with Molly Johnson. Harless' testimony also provides an example of how high-class prostitution provided women access to mobility from city to city, um, and through recruiting, madams attempted to influence the moves made by prostitutes. Harless claimed that she was born in 1862 outside of Havana and brought to Peoria, Illinois as a small child by her father. At 17, she moved roughly 150 miles to Chicago, where she lived with a handful of families before her debut as a prostitute at Nellie Costello's brothel. From Chicago, she went to Cincinnati, only to come back after three weeks. Upon her return to Chicago, she went to work for Emma Ritchie at 122 Fourth Avenue, the same brothel where she first met Townsend. According to Harleth, Townsend took, Townsend took a great fancy to me and attempted to persuade her to come to work in her brothel. However, Harleth already had plans to go to Denver for the winter. Harleth claimed she eventually planned to travel to New Orleans, but Townsend died around the same time that Harleth made it to back to Chicago from Denver. She married in October of the following year, ending her career as a high-class high prostitute, even though she had left her husband by the time she testified for the interveners of the Townsend secession in January 1886. Jeanette Harleth provides a clear example of how young women engaged in high-class prostitution had a considerable degree of autonomy and a wide range of mobility during this time. Harla's story also demonstrates the relative ease in which she exercised mobility to leave prostitution for marriage. The value of her testimony is all of the extraneous information she provided about herself and Townsend's recruiting trips to Chicago, especially since neither Carrie Watson nor Emma Ritchie testified in Townsend secession. Not only did Harless, test, Harless testimony demonstrate how independent and mobile she was as a high-class prostitute, but also how establishing connections with madams who attempted, attempted to influence her movement served to increase her options about travel and work. The fact that she did not take up Townsend's offer and come to New Orleans to work um, demonstrates that prostitutes themselves controlled where they went and who they worked for. The more connections these women had with madams like Townsend provided a greater number of options to travel the country and exert economic independence. As Harla's story also demonstrates, once they left prostitution for marriage or other reasons, access to these various modes of mobility and thereby power also vanished. According to the 1860 census, when Townsend was still working as a prostitute, the birthplaces of madams and prostitutes in New Orleans indicate that mobility across the country 
played an important role in high-class prostitution. At that time, 51 women, including Kate Townsend, worked out of six high-class brothels in New Orleans. Of these six madams, none of the women were foreign-born, and only one was born in New Orleans. Of the five remaining women, two each were from Virginia and Kentucky, and one came from New York. Out of the 51 prostitutes, 39, or 76 percent, of these women were native-born and from states outside Louisiana. The most popular home state was New York, with eight women hailing from the Empire State, followed by four women each from Virginia and Maine. Three women each came from Massachusetts and Alabama, while two women each came from Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Kentucky. The remaining 10 women came from New Hampshire, Connecticut, Vermont, New Jersey, Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi, North Carolina, and Texas. Six or 12% of the 51 women were born in Louisiana, and two of these six were native to New Orleans. The remaining six or 12% of the 51 women were foreign born. Three of these six were from Germany, two from Ireland, including Townsend, and one from England. Even though the birthplaces of these women ranged far and wide, New York was the most popular home state, suggesting the popularity of New York City among high-class madams, um, among high-class madams in New Orleans to recruit prostitutes. Census data of Townsend's brothel in 1870 further demonstrates the mobility of prostitutes and the importance of these madam networks, as most of the women working for her were native-born yet born outside of Louisiana. The 1870 census recorded 14 prostitutes working for Townsend at 40 Basin Street. Of these 14 women, only two or 14% were foreign-born, one from Scotland and one from Canada. Of the remaining 12 women, none of whom claimed to have foreign-born parents, um, only three or 22% were born in Louisiana, while the remaining nine or 64% were born in five other states. Three women were from New York. The other four were from Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, and Kentucky. The fact that several women were from New York, Ohio, and Illinois potentially reflects Kate Townsend's choices of recruiting in Cincinnati, New York, and Chicago. At the same time, at least nine additional high-class brothels existed in New Orleans with similar patterns regarding their prostitutes. The census enumerated 29 women working in these brothels in 1870. Of these 29 women, only one or 3% was foreign-born from Canada, and the remaining 28 were native-born. Of these, only two or 6% were born in Louisiana, the remaining 26 or 90% were born in other states. Of these native-born women, nearly half came from New York, which was eight women, or Ohio, which was four women, while three women each came from Alabama and Missouri. Two women were from Pennsylvania, and then one woman um, was born in each of these locations, Maine, Washington, D.C., Virginia, Missouri, and Mississippi. Overall, these specific statistics reflect how important mobility and madam networks were to running a high-class brothel because an overwhelming majority of the women who worked in high-class brothels were born outside of Louisiana. Finally, the composition of both Kate Townsend and Carrie Watson's brothel in Chicago indicate the same trends of mobility of high-class prostitutes from 1860 in 1870, continued in 1880, and applied in cities beyond New Orleans. According to the 1880 census for Chicago and New Orleans, Townsend and Watson each employed seven prostitutes. Ten, or 71 percent, of the 14 women were from states other than Illinois or Louisiana. Three women each came from Ohio and New York, while one woman each came from Maryland, Massachusetts, Kentucky, and Wisconsin. Three or 21% of the 14 women came from either Louisiana or Illinois. Um, the two Louisiana natives worked in Townsend's brothel and the woman from Illinois worked for Wathen. Only one or 7% of the 14 women um, were, was foreign born and she was from Germany. 
Overall, the profiles of prostitutes in high-class brothels captured in the census data um, from New Orleans over the course of three decades reveal how incredibly mobile these women were because they were mostly native born, but born outside of Louisiana. Undoubtedly, the existence of Madam Networks played a significant role in facilitating the mobility of prostitutes from city to city across the country. Despite the fact that the percentage of Louisiana born climbed from 12% in 1860 um, and to 21% in 1880, this still makes it unlikely that high-class prostitutes worked in brothels in their home cities and states. The percentage of women from other states was consistently over 70% over the course of the three decades, demonstrating that the mobility of native-born women was a defining feature of high-class prostitution during the 19th century. In addition, 20% of all high-class prostitutes evaluated over the span of these three decades hailed from New York, indicating that New York City played a major role in the Madam Networks. Even though Kate Townsend preferred Chicago, she made three recruiting trips to New York and brought back women to work in her brothel. In making these trips, Townsend most likely utilized the advice and knowledge of her predecessors, such as Clara Fisher or even Nellie Otis, who made such trips to New York in the late 1850s and 1860s, further demonstrating the importance of the connections among women that were a, the driving force for mobility within prostitution. The success of high-class madams such as Kate Townsend depended on these madam networks to facilitate the mobility of young white native-born women to travel across the country to work in their brothels. As census data as well as Harleth's, Harleth's testimony demonstrate, high-class prostitutes exercised a high degree of mobility. In addition, the various relationships Kate Townsend had with madams and prostitutes I'll demonstrate that mobility was essential to high-class prostitution. It is largely because of the relationships and connections madams and prostitutes established with one another that the mobility of high-class prostitutes was frequent and at times far-ranging. The fact that these madams chose to operate cooperatively instead of competitively underscores the fact that they, were, they fully understood how cooperation with other madams would allow them to thrive as sophisticated and wealthy businesswomen. In addition, their participation in these networks often imitated respectability, which underscores the fact that these women fully understood both the economic power they had, they held existed within the limitations of their disreputable occupation as imposed by American society. In the end, the decades long search for the, Sar for the Scarlet Sisterhood has finally produced tangible results and that the sisterhood existed in the form of these high-class madam recruiting networks. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lindsay. And thanks, thank you for your adaptability. Now, Stephanie, we're starting to run out of time, but uh, let's, hear your, uh, let's hear your comments. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, I hope I am visible and audible um, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Awesome. Okay. So first I want to thank the three panelists, um, for their very thought provoking and illuminating papers and also for dealing with tech issues. I mean, these are just sort of, this is the, these are the times we live in. Um, each paper addresses dangerous and disorderly behavior, as well as ideas of respectability, class, and to some extent, race, um, oftentimes in sort of coded ways. So I cannot comment on everything, but I would like to sort of add some, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I would like to add some comments that I think um, might connect all the works, but first I will address each paper. So first is Virginia Keynes, Openly and Notoriously, Prostitution, Urban Space, and Morality in Birmingham, Alabama, 1880 to 1920, which explores the primarily the life and brothel operation of Louise Wooster, in Birmingham uh, between 1880 and 1920. 
Now, Wooster and others are allowed to operate in Birmingham, Alabama, mostly with impunity um, until the city becomes more structured financially, legally, politically. Um, and after the city undergoes a more formal structure, brothels, even ones that are considered high class, such as Wooster's, are moved to a less visible space, a space that is seemingly less respectable than the city center. And the move leads residents, such as Felicia Tedeschi, to issue, issue formal complaints about the neighborhood's connection to criminality, like prostitution, um, uh, as well as sort of other aspects of criminality connected to, say, violence. And to quote from Kane's um, own work, um, it reveals how poor, disfranchised, and immigrant women, not just middle-class reformers, saved Southern urban spaces. Now, Wooster has a very well-known history in Birmingham. She is often lauded for her work with the sick and the ailing, and it's likely that some of her charitable works might be a little bit more legend than reality. However, the most important part I think of Kane's work is the exploration into Wooster's operation after she is relegated to the red light district. Prior to the connection or creation of this red light district, um, Wooster experiences a level of respectability not often witnessed by prostitutes turned madam. But as the city grows, um, is there a space for the likes of Wooster? And I think what we see is that in some ways there is not. The city relies on finding prostitutes and other folks engaged in aberrant behavior. Um, and they do this rather than imprisoning them because this is a source of revenue that helps to continue build up a city like Birmingham. It builds up their finances. So by confining Wooster and others into a district or a red light district, we see that folks who live in this district though do not approve. And so you have folks like Felicia Tedeschi, and I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Um, they object to what they believe is criminality run rampant in their neighborhood. And that criminality does not simply mean prostitution, but it's also connected to gambling and drinking. Activities that may impay, uh, impede her family's ability to make a living in Birmingham. Now, because Tedeschi is of Italian, Italian origin, I was struck by the idea of race and ethnicity. And I wondered if perhaps um, in Kane's larger work, um, she may be exploring or finding the issues of race are playing a bigger role. And I think about this particularly um, related to the issue of race and eth ethnicity. Sorry, I'm tongue tied. Um, and especially as more and more um, sort of um, uh, uh, immigrants are moving into the Birmingham area. So one of the things I thought about with Kane's work is I'm curious about the specific laws in Birmingham. Were women arrested and fined for prostitution, street walking, vagrancy? given that there seems to be a larger effort to criminalize the space or place and actions that surround prostitution, I'm curious about the law and um, how it specifically targets prostitution as a city like Birmingham develops. So next I would like to talk about Patricia Lynn McCourt's work, these uh, delirious drugs, the gendering of addiction in the U.S., South and um, the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914. Now McCord explores the world of drug use in the late 19th century among women with a specific concentration on opiates and the administration of those opiates by physicians. She argues that by analyzing the stigmatization of vice through the lens of gender, 
that widely held assumptions about health and respectability were just as crucial in diminishing the female addict population as it was in creating it. Her work contributes to larger work about drug use, addiction and treatment in the late and sort of early 20th century, late 19th and early uh, 20th century, and perhaps influences how we see these issues today. Physicians and women and the public expressed concerns about narcotic use among women. Some of the concerns seems to be based on um, the issue of respectability. Respectability of treating what may be dismissed as women's ailments um, and treating those ailments with opiates. But the concern is also tangled up with ideas of respectability and narcotic use among African-Americans. McCourt focuses primarily on white women and their use of opiates, as well as the pushback from what seems to be a middle-class white women constituency regarding drug use. I see attitudes about health and respectability playing a role here. And complicating this role are two things. The first is while McCourt notes the medical industry's roles um, in their attempts to regulate narcotics, there's also a role to criminalize drug use. But I notice that there is an undercurrent, and perhaps it is an overcurrent, of race and drug use. So overall, as McCourt notes, the historiography suggests punitive measures created what she called, um, and what she, she did not call, but she references another historian, right? The, um, she, what they call the American junkie. And I think there are larger issues here to flesh out. Likely these are issues she is addressing probably in her broader work. Um, I think the role of race is incredibly important here, particularly with white women versus say black men and drug use. But I was also struck, and I hope I'm interpreting this correctly, that there was a concern about cocaine use with the black community, um, perhaps mostly amongst men, but of opiate use in the white community, mostly among women. And the concern I think is very interesting. I found that um, McCourt's work uh, is incredibly informative. It's incredibly researched. But at times I wondered about the larger role of race. And I was also struck in some ways by where is the role of white men? They seem to be the writers of these advertisements. And of course they are also the writers of legislation. And so I wonder if there is something underneath the surface regarding cocaine use versus opiate use. Are we beginning to see um, a division in choice of drug use and how people use drugs and how they are categorized. Typically, I would not go into sort of these contemporary ideas, but McCourt brings up contemporary notions about drunk you, drug use. And it's hard for me not to think about the ways in which certain drugs are racialized. I am well aware that this moves beyond the scope of what McCourt is exploring but given that she introduces the potential of this, I think it's important to um, uh, question or challenge this in a deeper way. On more contemporary um, ideas of drug use, I also think it's important to think about the criminalization. Again, something um, that McCord is bringing up. Now she does this primarily through a gender lens, but I also wonder if there is um, a, a place for a racialized lens in this. And again, I wanna remind you all that this is not um, what McCourt is addressing, but I think because she brings this up, it's important for us to ask about this incredibly well-searched um, and engaging research. As far as Lindsay um, Silver, um, rethinking the Scarlet Sisterhood, mobility and respect be, respectability in high-class madam networks. Um, Silver's work explores the relationships 
between what we might consider high class madams um, and the prostitution trade, particularly how it relates to mobility in the late 19th century. She focuses on Kate Townsend and argues that through Townsend's experiences, we might see the ways Madam Sisterhood or a Madam Sisterhood worked and the mobility and agency the system provided to sort of the frontline workers. And what I mean by frontline workers, I mean the women in the bedrooms. So overall, I think Silver's work contributes a very unique and specific amount of information about the structure and operations um, of brothels in the late 19th century, particularly prior to the enactment of the Mann Act in 1910, which criminalized the transportation of women across state lines for moral purposes. I was struck though by the idea of sisterhood. And it made me look back at one of the most important works in this field, which is by Ruth Rosen called Le The Lost Sisterhood. Rosen's work is relatively sort of in the same time frame as Silver's. Although Rosen looks primarily at prostitutes or sex workers in the industry rather than say elite madams who might run the industry, I wondered about this idea of sisterhood. Who exactly does this sisterhood benefit? And how do we define it? It's clear that some women had a choice in where they wanted to work, according to Silver. But I wonder about the benefits as it relates to mobility. Does sisterhood extend beyond the madams? How does the women or how do the women who run these brothels provide a sisterhood for the women working in these brothels? There's clearly agency occurring, especially when looking at the succession documents um, related to Towson. But I wonder why women would need to travel to different brothels. Who benefits from that travel? Is it the madams? Is it the clientele? Perhaps it's the sex workers. Mobility is an incredibly important aspect in the field of sex work. It reveals many aspects of the field um, to scholars. Sometimes agency um, uh, it reveals itself and there is agency in mobility. In this case, I think mobility reveals in some ways the role of class when it comes to brothels. I suspect it also reveals the role of race, but race is not fully addressed in this paper. However, I do believe that Silver is um, focusing primarily on white women. And I do think that would be an important thing to note at the beginning of this paper. And if I missed it, I apologize. But given that there is a range of racial experiences in New Orleans, I think it's important to make sure um, to note how race plays a role in these high class brothels. And again, I'm sure that Silver does this in the larger work. Um, right, it's only a 15 to 20 minute presentation. So the last thing I wanna note is some common threads. There is an idea of respectability that runs through all of these papers. And um, uh, I think back to sort of even my own dissertation advisor, who was always telling me to pull threads through, always pull a thread fully through. And it led me to wonder how respectability plays a role in all three of these papers. Is it addressed, um, or, or excuse me, it is addressed in some papers overtly, in other papers that's sort of under the surface. So I'm curious what accounts for some women's respectability and for other women's lack of respectability. And women's agency, of course, also plays a huge role in all of these papers. How does agency play out with a woman's decision to take opiates or decline the advice of her physician or to seek out the advice of a so-called um, medical professional in an advertisement? How does agency play a role in sex work? 
And whether that is in sex work as a madam seeking to establish herself in a respectful manner in her town or her, in her establishment or in her decision to move from brothel to brothel, how do these things play out? Lastly, given the paper title, I wonder how dangerous really are these women? Are these women disorderly? In what ways are they posing threats to society, to their community, to their families? These papers are amazing. They were all so intriguing. They were well researched. They were super informative. And again, I thank the presenters for providing me with information relevant in some ways to my own work and perhaps to many of your works as we contemplate the designation of dangerous, disorderly damsels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. And I think that we have unfortunately reached the end of our time. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I want to thank. I thought you. we had till I thought we had till five thirty. Am do I we, incorrect on that? Do we have? I thought we had until five. What um, can someone? Can someone tell? Does someone else know? Um, how long the session goes. I thought it was an hour and a half. Okay, so it does seem to be till five. Um, I apologize. So um, uh, presenters and Mara, I'm, I'm happy to stick around for, uh, well, no, there, nobody's gonna ask me questions, but I'm happy to stick around for a few moments um, if the presenters want to take questions. I am happy to stick around as well. Do we want, um, Patricia, do you want to um, join in? Does anyone want to respond to Stephanie's comments? Um, we do not have any in the Q&A, but um, do you have any thoughts or shall we say thank you and we'll have another opportunity to- <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm wondering, y'all, can you see me? Um, just because I'm not seeing myself on my computer. No, we're not seeing you. Weird. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, y'all can hear me. Yes. Okay. Well, no big deal. You don't need to see me. But th your commentary was so fabulous. Really, very well detailed. And, and both of you did awesome as chair and commentator. So thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. We appreciate yes. that. Um, uh, thank you. All right. I think we will um, um, bring the session to a close. I want to thank everybody for their engagement and patience through all the uh, technical problems. And I am very excited to see all this work and the ways in which it overlaps and uh, the weaving together of these stories about propriety, respectability, orderliness and disorderliness. So thank you very much. Congratulations presenters. These were um, fantastic papers and, and thank you Mara for facilitating this. We appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I think we will have our get together on Saturday and we can take, we can take this on forward. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a great evening.